Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Technical Details of Fire and Smoke Damper Actuator Replacements, which is going to be presented by Larry Felker. We really appreciate you joining us today. My name is Ron Pilkwitz and I'll be your moderator. Because you may want to watch this webinar again or share it with others, it will be recorded and posted on Belimo's YouTube site. And we will have a question and answer session at the end of this presentation, so Larry would like to get some questions from you. I invite you to type your questions into the questions box at any time, but I will read them aloud during the question and answer session. Larry is going to answer as many questions as we have time for. If he does not get to your question, please rest assured you will, answer, you will get an answer via email. If you are having any difficulty, please simply type me a note in the question box and I will try to assist you. And I am now going to turn this right over to Larry. Thank you, Larry. Hello. We're going to be looking at actuators on old dampers primarily here. Uh, we'll take a little look at the uh, uh, basics of fire smoke dampers today. Then we'll look at, you know, we'll look at the replacements and then uh, where to get uh, more information. A half hour session is uh, hardly enough time to cover all the different applications. Life safety dampers. So we have two types that are actuated, smoke and combination fire and smoke. Uh, we can uh, sense temperature mechanically using a fusible link or a bimetal, uh, but we have no uh, mechanical way of measuring smoke. So it's smoke dampers and the smoke damper part of the combination uh, that requires an actuator because we're going to measure uh, smoke uh, electronically and then uh, activate a relay to open or close a, uh, a damper via the actuator. The combination fire and smoke damper uh, will have a smoke detector in the duct, typically, and uh, there'll be a uh, temperature sensitive device, or as you all calls them, a heat responsive uh, device. It's a bimetal, but that's what makes it a fire damper, and the combination has the smoke, so it has an actuator. So looking at replacements, start with the damper. I have to rub this in all the time. Uh, people will send us pictures of an actuator, an old one, and we don't know how it was applied. Uh, we got to look at the whole damper as well as the actuator. Uh, this is an example of one where uh, it looks like you've got a uh, spring return motor, but it's not. Uh, there's a spring on the damper shaft that has to be disabled before you go put new motor on there. Uh, they're not all that difficult, but you got to investigate them. So 80% of them are drug coupled, very easy, uh, but 20% are, are old methods that are definitely awkward. Notice the proverbial board holding up the damper on that. Another example of starting with a damper. Well, we've got that one on the left there. It's got a pulley, a cable, and we can't replace that motor. It's not made anymore. However, the example on the right, well, here's what we did to solve it. We simply put a linkage in and mounted the motor with a bracket, and then it works just normal. Sometimes, you shouldn't replace the actuator, replace the damper. Uh, the left side picture there, we've got blade clash. Uh, there's no way you're going to get that to work right. On the right side, well, they got a code violation right off the bat. The shaft is inside the sheetrock. The whole purpose of the sheetrock is to stop fire. So you can't go cutting it open like that. So that damper should be replaced. Uh, you got to get uh, that shaft out of the wall. Most of them are very easy, just like this. On the left side, you got a drug coupled motor. Shaft, damper shaft is available. You're going to be able to just take that off and drop a new motor right on there.
on this one, it's going to be very similar. You can pull the old motor off, disconnect the electrical, but there's a spring underneath that motor. Square housing there. So you have to remove that square housing and remove the old spring. Otherwise, your new motor would have to work against the old spring as well as its own internal spring. So this is what that damper looks like when we've pulled it off. And now we just do a couple of motor on there. Either it's a small damper, you would be unlikely to use this big actuator for it. Sometimes you bump into these brackets that were used on very small dampers. Uh, you have a few choices. You could uh, keep the old bracket and mount uh, our anti-rotation strap right on the bracket, uh, but easier is just to use our smallest motor because that bracket only existed on small dampers. So you can go to an FSTF and mount it much easier because the, it doesn't use up as much space, it's half the size. Now those were spring method one, where it was obvious where the spring was or it was internal to the motor. A large number of the old dampers are dual springs. There was a spring inside on the shaft. Picture on the right shows one. There's a fusible link there, and that takes care of the fire function. So if that thing heats up to 165 uh, degrees F, the fusible link will melt, and that spring will engage and slam the damper blade shut. During normal operation, it's held open by an arm, and it's not a load on the actuator. So this was a very common method on, on older dampers. This is what they were doing long ago, 20 years, 30 years. We'd have a fire damper. There's a spring on the jack shaft. There are two arms with a fusible link, keeping that spring from being engaged. The damper would be in the duct. If it heated up to 165F, the fusible link melts, the damper blade slam closed. Now what they did to create a smoke damper is they'd extend the jack shaft. Since the spring wasn't a load on the actuator, you could then mount an actuator on the outside. And all they used was an extended jack shaft. So the jack shaft spring and the fusible link took care of the fire closing function. The smoke closing function is taken care of by the actuator. So the actuator was wired through the smoke detector. Here's another example of that. You got a shaft spring, arrow point to it. You got a fusible link and two arms. You can't see the fusible link. And then on the outside, they'd have a motor. Well, what you do to replace this one is, number one, don't touch the internal spring. You leave that and the fusible link alone, unless you've seen signs of corrosion on the fusible link. Uh, or if you see any cracks on it, you don't need to replace it either. Uh, but when you have a defective old motor, you take off everything over there. So you're gonna take off the arms, the rods, ball joints, and the bracket. You leave the bearing, there's a bearing in, uh, between, uh, right, on, right on the outside of the damper, well, that's holding the shaft on, so you leave the bearings alone. So then you can just do a couple direct to that damper shaft. You don't try to replace the motor as much as you bring it up to a modern standard. Another example, the spring is on the outside of the motor. There's a narrow point to it. You got a little bracket, but you ignore all that. You take it all off and there's the damper shaft. You just do a couple to that shaft. So you ignore the old motor and all the parts and direct couple. And another example, cable, screen door spring, 
well, we can't replace that motor, but we can go straight to the damper shaft, the arrow pointing to it, and you can draw a couple right on that shaft. Here, the external spring is quite visible, so it's essentially the same as a modern Bolimo. You can simply take off the bracket, the spring, being careful because that thing's under torsion. Uh, you remove it, and then you can direct couple the actuator on there. You're going to bend the anti-rotation strap, and you can mount direct couple the Bolimo actuator. Same thing here, over our, there on the left, you can't even see the motor, but it's underneath it. We pull everything off. On the right side, now uh, the shaft was short, so we internally mounted the uh, clamp. And you can see we left the motor. You can see its shaft sticking out there at the top. Uh, we left the motor there because it made a nice space for the anti-rotation strap. I think we should have. Have sawed the shaft off though to make it look a little bit nicer. Now there was another spring method used. They had one spring and it worked for both the actuator and the fusible link. And in this case, you got to go install a new heat responsive device in by metal. So there on the right is an example. That spring was used to close the damper both for the uh, smoke closing function, it was a non-spring motor, and if the fusible link melted. So you got to replace the fusible link with a bolt, and then you have to mount a thermal sensor on the outside. Uh, we have a full instructions on each of these that I've shown you. Uh, they're on our website. Uh, so you can actually go look at them step by step, what's going on with them. But uh, this one requires that you disable that spring. There on the left, we're going to disconnect that spring. We're going to un unhook it. And then you got to add the heat responsive bimetal. And so you're going to electrically cut power to the actuator to spring close for both heat and smoke. Essentially, you're bringing it up to modern method for fire and smoke dampers. And now and then you run into the negator spring dampers. There were a good 100,000 of them made. Uh, there were weird. You had on the right side, you can see a spring, and it's connected directly to the blade. And there's a rod up above it. It's not a straight linkage rod. It's a fusible rod, so it would melt at 165. In addition, there was another fusible link inside uh, holding a, uh, a little uh, catch uh, and a latch plate that would hold the damper closed. Uh, so when you bump into this one, you got to disconnect the old uh, parts and actually put a, a regular rod in and then you add a thermal sensor. The pneumatic ones are easier to repair than the electric ones. Uh, but we've got a full instruction about it. So if you bump into a negator spring damper where the spring's connected to the blade, uh, we have an instruction, actually several. Here's how the wiring will work for any of the replacements. You're gonna have your smoke detector, a normally closed contact. You'll have your 165F bimetal, then you'll have your actuator. So if either the smoke detector or the bimetal open up because of smoke or high temperature, you cut power to the actuator and they spring closed. Torque. I've actually never really had a fire and smoke damper problem with torque. We uh, have good rules of thumb, and from manufacturer to manufacturer, they're very similar. Roughly 50% of the dampers installed are less than two square feet. 
so our little FSTF motor works for them. Roughly 30% are between two and four square feet. So the FSLF works just fine. And there's 80% of your market, those small dampers. When you get to the four to 12 square feet, we recommend the FSNF. It's actually UL listed uh, for modern dampers up to 16 square feet. Uh, but we, by being a little conservative, never have a problem. And then when you get to multi-section or larger dampers, well, about 10% are bigger than 12 square feet. And there you'll use our big motor or several of them. The pneumatic to electric at the top left there. There's a pneumatic actuator. It's held on a bracket and the damper shaft, which is that middle orange arrow, is pointing at the damper shaft. Uh, there's your damper shaft, so you're gonna not try to replace the motor. You're not gonna try to do a linear push-pull thing with a crank arm. You'll simply do it. It's on the right picture. You'll do a couple, the motor, right over that existing damper shaft. Uh, you might notice there we left the pneumatic bracket because it was a good place for mounting the anti-rotation strap. Where to get additional information. Now the codes require periodic testing and repair of any damper, both the IBC and the IFC, and they International Building Code and International Fire Code, uh, the model codes for the whole U.S. for everywhere. And then the International Fire Code, well, both of them refer to NFPA 80 and NFPA 105, which are the two standards for doors and dampers. And there they require that your Chapter 7 containment dampers, 85% of the market, the ones that just have a smoke detector in the duct, they need to be tested every four years in commercial buildings, every six years in hospitals. If they're in a smoke control system, uh, the rules change. If they're dedicated, if their only purpose is smoke control, then they have to be tested twice a year. If they're not dedicated, if they're part of the HVAC system, say typically the economizer, uh, which is gonna open the uh, outdoor and the exhaust and totally flush the building, they need to be tested once a year. And it's the building owner's responsibility, but the contractor uh, is advised to have them in their service contracts and. Uh, make sure the people are uh, up to code. We have instructions on our website. They're all very similar. Uh, number one rule, before you replace uh, the actuator, make sure the damper works properly. It should open and close smoothly. Uh, the duct should be cleaned. Uh, you should dry lubricate the uh, seals. Make sure the damper works right. And then the contents, well, we have the UL statement saying you, you, you can replace actuators. That's not a, uh, the actual code says you have to replace and repair. Uh, any code and standard issues, what NFPA says about the subject. And then we go into the technical issues of replacing them. And there's a form on the last page of every one of the instructions. Uh, that you can fill out where you've done a test and uh, leave it on site, uh, which is required by NFPA 80 and 105, uh, so that during any inspections by the building official or the fire marshal, uh, they can see that the dampers have been inspected and tested. This is what the website looks like. There's two of them that have the instructions on them. There's the U.S. site and then the California, or the, uh, the Canada site. The first thing on there is a competitive replacement, 
with a lot of pictures in it so you can identify what you're looking at. And then there are individual instructions and they start with the damper mix. So the first one is air balance is damper, things that are specific to air balance. But it goes through all the different damper manufacturers and covers all the old applications. That is the end. There's my email address at the bottom. Uh, any questions, or if anyone wants a class covering a specific instruction or a specific application, I'm happy to do that. Uh, and now we can open it up to any questions. Well, thank you very much, Larry. We do have some questions that have come in, but remember, please type in your message, your questions right now, and I can ask them a lot of Larry provided we have time. If not, Larry will get back to you via email. Before we move on to questions, please remember to follow Belima on social media to keep informed about what's happening. Okay, for pneumatic to electric retrofit, are the dampers still UL listed? Not really. Uh, any old damper that isn't wasn't constructed using the present UL standards is no longer listed, but they're grandfathered in. Pneumatic to electric would be the same way. The pneumatic actuator was, you know, that's a long-lived motor or actuator. Uh, it's probably uh, before the current standard, so it can't be UL listed. Uh, however, once you're looking at repair work, it's up to the local AHJ and local codes, not up to UL anymore. So the local inspector could ask for UL damper to be installed. Uh, but we do a lot of pneumatic to electric replacement. So the inspectors are saying that's perfectly fine as long as it's done right. Okay, thank you, Larry. Will you show the website address again for more information, please? Okay. There at the top. Excellent. What permits are necessary for a pneumatic to electronic replacement? An electrical permit would be required for running the power. Uh, no other permit would be required except if you're uh, making any structural changes, uh, cutting in the drywall, uh, or if you touch uh, the fire alarm uh, wiring. Uh, they might not require a permit, but if you've touched fire alarm wiring, it should be retested. Okay. Next question, can Bolimo actuators be used on any existing smoke dampers without impacting the UL listing of the entire assembly? It would, it would vary by the manufacturer. In general, yes, because we're UL listed with all the damper manufacturers. And it's not UL who oversees repair and replacement. It's NFPA. So the listing becomes a bit of a moot question. It's up to the local authority having jurisdiction <clears throat> and NFPA standards, 80 and 105. Okay. If we change a 120 volt actuator to a 24 volt actuator, will the fire damper lose the UL certification? That is an issue that comes up frequently. Strictly speaking, no, as long as you're putting on a an actuator that uh, is UL listed with the damper. Um, however, you can check with the damper manufacturer. It might be that they want one of their people to do the change out or they might have you do it using their instruction. It's up to their policy. One of the ways to avoid that is to read the specs and make sure you're, you're 
uh, putting in 24 or 120 as required. Uh, but a lot of the specs are missing that information or they have it garbled. Uh, typically, most common, although this is not absolute, it's a smoke control system done by a control contractor that'll have 24 volt, whereas your containment chapter seven type dampers will be 120 volt. Okay, we'll take one more question. Can a standard FSD about 10 years old be converted to a, a reopenable FSD with end switches for smoke control and maintain a UL listing for the damper actuator assembly? Yes, what, since it's 10 years old, it was made during the current standard. So you're gonna have to add switches. Uh, you're gonna have to add a secondary heat responsive device and you would call UL's field services and have them come out and inspect, and they would write up a report. Uh, if you're doing everything according to the current standard, they can even label it. Uh, but I would check with my AHJ and find out if he even requires that. But you can, you can bring it up to a UL standard Okay. Thank you very much, Larry. Anything else that comes in afterwards, we will make sure you get you receive an email from Larry with a response. Once again, I want to thank you for attending today's webinar. I'd also like to thank you, Larry. And please join us for our next webinar, which is going to be on June 16th. Eddie Kelly will be discussing pressurization and its influence on healthy indoor air quality. Thank you, everyone, again, and have a great rest of your day.